Okay, well, we've talked about what does it mean to be in space versus in orbit, and we've talked about rockets, and we've talked about engines and propellants and physics and so on and so forth. So now we're going to go on to orbital mechanics and then to spacecraft. So this now would roughly, very roughly, correlate with Module 6 in the Civil Air Patrol Aerospace Education Program. So hopefully I can keep this interesting and also um, uh, you know, relevant to the whole subject. The first thing let's talk about is, remember when you went into orbit, we went into orbit, here's the Earth, and the way we got into orbit was flying at a speed such that we were falling at the same rate as the curvature of the Earth. And then you just go around forever, and that speed is roughly 17,500 miles per hour to get out of the atmosphere and then, and then have into that thing. The, the only thing that matters is the speed. Right now, obviously it takes a lot of energy to get through the atmosphere. It takes a lot of energy to generate that kind of a speed. But the only thing that matters ultimately is the speed you go. And that's, you're going to see speed coming up over and over again as I talk about orbital mechanics. Let me just say that orb orbital mechanics is a branch of science that deals with the peculiarities of orbits. How do you calculate orbits and how, wh what are the properties of things in orbit? And it applies as well to the Earth or to any celestial body. In fact, the Earth is, in fact, going around, you know, orbiting around the sun and, and so on and so forth. Um, so the first thing let's talk about is centripetal force. So, now, let's look at our little diagram here. At one moment, our little spacecraft is here, and it's going like that. It's going, you know, tangential to this circular orbit that it's in. At another time, further along, it's going in this direction. Now, the speed, right, the, the speed is always the same, but is the velocity the same? No, the velocity is different, right? And so, and why is that? Because there's a force acting on the object. So the first thing is, we talked about weightlessness the last time. Being in orbit confers on you weightlessness because you happen to be falling in a free fall state. You just never hit the ground. And so on a relative basis, things around you are falling at the same rate as you. So the net effect you have to them is it's like you're weightless. But are you, have you like escaped gravity? Or do, are you now in a position where gravity no longer acts on you? No, of course not. Gravity is still acting on you. And in fact, we see evidence of that. Because here the gravitational force is pulling the satellite this way. Here it's pulling it this way. So what have we done? The force changes the velocity. And in what way does it change it? It changes the direction, right? Remember, a vector has two components. It has a magnitude and it has a direction. So the vector is going like that. And so something is turning that vector. So we have gravity, right, the force of gravity is causing the velocity vector to change. Now as a result of having a changing velocity vector, we also have to have something that's Right. In fact, another way of saying changing velocity vector is to say acceleration. Unlike the accelerator in your car, when you step on the gas and you go faster, we're not going faster, we're just changing direction. And so, what do we call it when we have something? So imagine in the movie Napoleon Dynamite, I'm, Dynamite, I'm sure everyone's seen that, the tether ball, right? He's playing this thing, there's a ball attached to a rope, and it spins around this pole. The ball is tethered to the rope. It's always going to go in a circular path, and it's being pulled on by the rope. The same analogy applies here. The satellite is going around the Earth. It's, always, it's in a tethered configuration, except instead of having a string doing the tethering, what's doing the tethering? It's the force of gravity. 
Now, Newton, a long time ago, worked out an equation for the force of gravity. This is the only time, well, virtually the only time I'm going to bring up any equations. I think it's just a, a imperative that you see this as part of the overall understanding of what, how orbits behave and why they behave that way. The force of gravity is this gravitational constant, big G, times the mass of one body. In this case, it's the mass of the satellite times the mass of the other body, in this case it's the mass of the Earth, divided by the distance squared, right? The distance r is the distance between the center of the Earth, in this case, and the satellite. Now, let's just look at this for one second. Now, he derived this from data that was obtained from, by this guy Tycho Brahe, and also looking at the Kepler law, which we'll get to shortly, and he deduced this law but why is there an r squared term? Where else in math, in geometry, do you see r squared? Well, it comes into play in the area of a, the surface area of a sphere. Is equal to four pi r squared, where r is the radius of the sphere. So what we have here is we have the gravity, right, some force that's caused by the Earth, the mass of the Earth, and it's acting everywhere in equal, in, in every direction in equal amount. And so it's at any point along this sphere, right, a sphere that's bigger than the Earth, in this case a sphere that's the same size as the orbit, the gravity is acting the same. Now as we go out further, the sphere becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, right, so the surface area of the sphere becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, in proportion to the square of the radius, r squared. So if we had the same amount of gravitational mass, and now it's distributed over twice as big of a surface area, we're going to have one-fourth the amount of effect on each individual spot. Right? Another term in this context would be flux. You can think of the flux of gravity is, goes inversely as the square of the distance. So twice as far away, the sphere is four times the surface area, the flux is one-fourth. So that's where this r-squared term comes from, because we have a sphere, surface area of a sphere. You'll see this in many other physical properties in electromagnetism and in other areas where it's an r-squared attenuation rule. So we have this force of gravity, and we have some acceleration going on on the spacecraft. So now we can go back to our good friend Newton's second law. I think I can just fit this right in here. Right, F equals MA. F in this case is going to be gravity. A is going to be the centripetal acceleration. Right, the centripetal force is the tethering force. The centripetal acceleration is the changing velocity vector that comes from that. And so now we have a simple equation, F equals MA, and M is the mass of the satellite, MS to keep the same notation as down here. So now we can say we have G, MS, ME divided by R squared equals MS. And acceleration, centripetal acceleration is given as V squared over R, where V is the velocity. In this case, it's the velocity it took us to get into orbit. And R is that distance out from the center of the Earth v squared over r. And so now, if we just solve this, we can say that, well, here we have uh, an r term that cancels, right? A little simple algebra here. And then we have, this reminds me of a good joke I'm going to tell you in another minute. But anyway, so we have the r's cancel. So we have v squared is equal to big G, and the ms's cancel. Big G, M, E over R. And so then V, let's give, give a little hook here to where V's are distinguishable from the R's, is equal to the square root of G, M, E over R. And so this equation then is the basis for all orbital speed. So you pick a planet with a particular G and an M, E, right, in this case the Earth, 
the G con the G is actually universal, so that's independent of the of the body, as far as we know. You give me an R, a distance you are from the center, and I'll tell you what your orbital speed is. The only thing that matters when you're talking about orbital mechanics is speed. So now let me erase this. So we talked about centripetal, which then relates to velocity. I'm going to come back to that in terms of delta v, delta velocity at the end. Let me erase all this. Okay, so here's a here's the classic rock, rocket science joke. How many rocket scientists does it take to screw in a light bulb? Well, think about it. None. Silly. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to screw in a light bulb. That's well, all right. Hopefully that was funny. So now let's talk about Kepler. Kepler was a uh, astronomer. And he made a lot of, you know, he took a lot of measurements of stars and planets and things in particular, you know, over time as things went by. And from that, he deduced a law that says about essentially equal areas in equal times. And he said it's elliptical. So those are the Kepler laws, essentially. I don't know if it's actually one or two laws, but that's the essence of it in any case. So all orbits, we've always described in our limited discussion so far, we've only talked about orbits as being circles. And in fact, in that case, they are very close to circles, but an orbit is actually an ellipse. All orbits are ellipses. What is an ellipse? Well, it's simply something that is an oval shape. Now it's a mathematical construct. There's an equation in algebra in so-called analytic geometry for an ellipse. An ellipse has two foci. One of them would be a focus. And uh, it's an oval shape. Now if you, if you take the, if two, both foci are superimposed one on top of each other, then you get a circle. So a circle is a, spe a special case of an ellipse. So what he said is that it's all orbits are ellipses, and one and the and the, the celestial body is at one of the foci, foci, and this thing moves around. But as it moves around, now let me draw an ellipse that's a little bit different looking. So we'll keep the body the same. We'll just draw a, a longer ellipse, a long and thin ellipse. An ellipse, there's a term for that called eccentricity. That's, that's not really relevant, so I'll just mention it and go on. And what he said is equal areas and equal times. So here, we'll start it here. We'll say this is time zero. And from time zero to time one, we're going to sweep out this amount of area. Now from time one to time two, which is a, our time units have to be consistent, we're going to sweep out another equal area. Now notice as we get out further here, since it's a longer distance, it's going to be thinner, right? Well, here we had a, pie, a sort of a pie slice that was a little thicker. Here it's going to be a little bit thinner of a pie slice. So here's time two. And then as, since this continues to get longer and longer, these pie slices get thinner and thinner. Right, but I submit that in my cartoon here, the area in the green and the area in the red and the area in the blue are the same, right? They're equal areas and the equal times, time one, two, and three are the same. So notice what's happening to the vehicle. Well, from time zero to time one, it went this far. From one to two, it went this far. From two to three, it only went this far. And as we go out, it's going to go smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, smaller until it gets out here where we have a very long and thin area time. And then the reverse is going to happen on the other side. It's going to get slowly get bigger. So the result is that the ellipse affects the speed as this thing goes around. It's, and it's, so it's going fast here, and it's going slow here. Now, 
let me just go and use the same cartoon and we'll talk about some of these other things. That's really all that Kepler had to say, fast and slow, fast when it's close, slow when it's far away. So now we have a term for this. The point, the point where it's closest we call the apoapsis. And now in the case where, we, where it happens to be the, the orbit going around the Earth, then we replace apsis with some, uh, it's probably a, either Latin or Greek uh, suffix related to Earth, and we call it, then it becomes the apogee. Right, but if you were to go to the JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, where they manage all these explorer missions that do not stay bound to the Earth, and you said apogee, you'd say, what's the apogee of the orbit for you know, Voyager 1, everyone in the room would go like this. Because it's not an apogee. In that case, it would be an apoapsis. And the same thing is true. Well, now I screwed it up here. Ignore what I said partially. This is called the perigee. So periapsis, perigee. I, I apologize. The perigee is the point of closest... The farthest away point is the apoapsis. And an apogee in the case of an earthbound orbit. So it's an elliptical orbit. A circular orbit is essentially a special case in an elliptical orbit. Kepler's laws, and then this thing, this guy Tycho Brahe also was making measurements. Newton took advantage of both of those to come up with his gravitational law. Right, so remember the simple principles. We're in orbit, everything in orbit is determined by the speed. Every orbit has a speed. The further out you go, you have a different speed. The speed is governed by this equation, g m e over r, the square root of that. So notice as r gets bigger, speed goes down, right? So as r goes up, v is going to go down. So the further you are away, the slower you're going to go. That also is somewhat consistent with the elliptical orbs and the elliptical uh, orbit and the uh, Kepler law. So let's talk about maneuvers. So now we want to do something practical with being in space other than just enjoy the view. So let's draw a little cartoon. Here's our Earth. And we're, we launch and we're in an orbit. And this is not to scale. And it's also not a, going to be a very symmetrical drawing. This is our initial orbit. Now, in reality, what's, this, what's the diameter of the Earth? Well, the radius, I think the radius of the Earth is like 6378 kilometers. When we launch, we're going to be in an orbit that's maybe 200 kilometers high. So what we're really doing is, if this is the Earth, is this, you know, we're really just kind of barely above the Earth's surface. This drawing is way out of scale, but just for the sake of... Um, making the point it'll suffice. But we want to go to some other orbit. Well, what do we want, what, are, what can we do? We want to go to this orbit. A bigger orbit. In the next section I'll talk about why in the world you would ever want to go into a bigger orbit. How are you going to do it? Well, we're going to make, we're going to use a transfer orbit that looks like this. So essentially, we're going we're gonna to use our rocket motor. Hopefully it's a rocket motor that we can restart. Otherwise, we're not going to use it and we're not going to do this transfer. But we restart our motor. When we get here, we restart our motor and we make a burn. And we burn in the direction that we're going. 
And what's the result of this burn? Is that the apogee increases. So we make the burn here, and it takes us from having an apogee here and moves it out to there. Then when we get out here, so now we're in this elliptical orbit, the transfer orbit. We make a half a revolution in the transfer orbit. We get out to here, and then we burn, and we want to circularize. So we burn again in the direction that we're going. And the effect again is we raise the apogee. We, well, we, in this case, we, we raise the perigee. So it's going to take it from here, and it's going to move it out there. So now we have a circular orbit. So burning, so for orbital maneuvers, if you burn in the direction with the velocity vector, you raise the opposite side, right? And then obviously the contrary is also true. So if you burn against it, instead of burning in this direction, if we were to burn this way, it would go the other direction. But let's talk about that case in the context of going into lunar orbit. So imagine you want to go to the moon. So here's Earth, and here's the Moon. Well, we launch. When we launch, though, the only goal of, immediate, of the launch process itself is to get into orbit, right? Getting into orbit itself is not easy. That's all we want to do. So we end up in a circular orbit, a low Earth orbit around Earth. And then we do our elliptical transfer orbit. So we burn here. It puts us into a giant transfer orbit, which goes beyond the moon. And then when we get to the moon, we get to the back side of the moon, we burn this way. So we burn against the direction we're traveling. And then what that does is it lowers the corresponding apogee. And then it'll put us into a circular orbit around the moon. So that's how we got to the moon. Now there's a special term the general term for that elliptical transfer, they call it a Hohmann transfer. And this is a special case. They call this, since we're going to the moon, they call this translunar injection. That was a term that was on everyone's, the tip of everyone's tongues in the late 60s and early 70s. We haven't gone to the moon since then. Hopefully that term will again be on people's tongues sooner versus later when we go back and do some real exploratory work. Translunar injection. And by burning the opposite way, then we circulate. So now how do you get home from the moon? Well, so why is going to the moon extremely difficult, extra difficult? Because we have to carry enough fuel to get home. So now when we're done with our moon exploration, then when we get to this point again, we burn in the direction we're going to go back into this home and transfer elliptical orbit. And then down here, we'll burn the other way to circularize in the Earth orbit. And then eventually, you, you know, then you continue to burn. So what happens then is we're in an Earth orbit. We're not, but we need to get our astronauts back, right? We want to recover that piece of payload. So we continue to burn every time we get here against the direction we're traveling, and slowly the orbit goes like this, and then it goes like that, and it goes like that, and eventually what happens, it actually hits the Earth, and then that's how we get the guys back. So we burn against it continuously, it lowers the perigee. So that's the transfer, that's, that's the essence of maneuvering. Now let's, let's complicate life in one other way.
an orbit, when you're in orbit, you're spinning, the spacecraft is spinning, it's going in a circle. And three, you know, in, in our simplified world here, in our world of flat land, we, all, we looked at everything in two dimensions so far, but it's an actually a three dimensional situation. And the orbit is inertial. The orbit is inertial. That's a technical, that's a rocket science or physics term. Inertial means that it's, it's continuing to do the same thing forever, right? So it's essentially Right, remember the term, we talked about the term inertia as the, 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 the propensity to want to remain in the same state, whatever state that is. So the orbit is going, it's inertia, it's in one plane. Right, the orbit is in the surface of this piece of paper. Now, this piece of paper can go in many different directions, right? It can be oriented in all different kinds of ways, the attitude, so to speak, of this piece of paper in three dimensions. But it's always going to be a one plane. The orbit remains in that one plane. Now, when we launch, so here's the equator. So here's Earth, here's the equator, the North Pole, the South Pole. When we launch from the Cape, we're roughly here. Cape Canaveral. is in Florida, right? It's on the eastern coast of Florida. We'll get into much more details about launch operations later on. What's the latitude of Cape Canaveral? Well, Cape Canaveral, right, latitude is based on an angle from the equator, from the equatorial plane. Cape Canaveral is at 28 and a half degrees north latitude. And what do we do? We launch straight up because we want to get through the atmosphere as fast as possible. And we also take advantage of the fact that the Earth is rotating and we launch to the east. So that gives us a little of an additional boost. We get some free velocity there. And we also then go over the ocean so there's less risk to life. But when we get into orbit, when we achieve that speed and we go into orbit, we're in an orbit plane that's at an angle relative to the equatorial plane. So this is a plane, right? So let me. Let me make a, attempt to make something that's realistic and sort of an isometric drawing here. So this, this is a circular orbit in this plane. Right, so with the, at one point the satellite is going into the board here and at the other point it's coming out of the board here, going in a, plane, a circle like that. But it's at an, inc it's at an angle we, to the equator of 28 degrees. We call that the inclination of the orbit. And that affects our life because there, in certain situations we want to put a satellite into an orbit at the equator and then we have to make a transfer that not only is going to raise apogee or perigee and circularize but we also may have to change from one orbit plane to another and we'll talk about this later on also. This takes more energy to do that orbital plane transfer. But think about it, the orbit is inertial so we're in this plane, and we're spinning around, you know, roughly every 90 minutes or so. We'll make one period. Right, so one complete revolution around the Earth every 90 minutes. What's the Earth doing? Well, the Earth is on its axis. The Earth is spinning on its axis. And so the orbit then is going to go over different parts of the Earth. So now let's draw the ground tracks. And I'm going to have to erase this because I don't have a space. So you understand that we're in, we're in an orbit plane that's inertial. It's at an angle of 28, 28 and a half degrees to the equatorial plane. Now let's draw the ground track for what that orbit looks like. We're going to use a, 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 a type of map which represents the surface of the Earth as a rectangle. Here's the equator. Here's the North Pole and the South Pole. 
So notice how this map happens to be distorted, right? Because the North Pole is actually just one point, but here we're representing it as this whole line. The equators are a long distance. So things, when you look at a map in this, in this fashion, th things that are further north in latitude become oversized relative to things at the equator. This is called a Mercator projection. Right, there is a way to draw a map of the Earth where everything is to the proper scale, but it has these weird pieces that are disconnected and it would be extremely hard to make anything sensible out of orbital mechanics with that. So we're going to use a Mercator projection. Just remember that it's the, the northern latitudes are actually being distorted to be bigger, right? Canada is not as big as it looks on a, on a, a map like this. So what happens? We launch here, we'll say this is Cape Canaveral, and we go straight up, and now we're in orbit, and we're going in our inertial plane. The Earth is essentially rotating underneath us on its own schedule. What's the net result? So we're in a plane, we're going like this, the Earth is rotating that way. The net result is we have a sine wave. We have something that's like sinusoidal in nature. So it's going to go, and here's the, uh, can anyone see the obvious stupid mistake already? already? Is, the, is Cape Canaveral on the equator? No, it's not. Ignore, ignore that, that's incorrect. We have to put in 28 and a half degrees north latitude, and there's the Cape. So that's where we, that's where we start out, when we actually get into orbit. Now, what direction are we going to go? We're going to go this way, because we launched to the east to get that boost from the rotation of the Earth. So we're, our path is going to go like this. Now, let's put in the uh, 28 and a half degrees south latitude. Because remember, our plane is going to go, and on one case, it's 28 and a half north. In the other case, it's the other side, it's 20 and a half down, right? Now, that's arbitrary, right? The, nobody ever said that the, what we call the North Pole had to be up. But anyway, we'll just use that convention. Our ground track is going to look like a sine wave. and go like this, and at some point we go off the board and then we come back on. Right, and so on and so forth, then it just goes forever. Now what's the first thing you notice about our ground track? It does not repeat, right? Every time we go, we come flying over the same latitude, we're at a different spot on the Earth. It does not repeat. There is a term for an orbit that does, re that does repeat. It's called sun synchronous. We'll talk about that in the next segment. And there's specific reasons why we might want to use a sun synchronous orbit. But in general, the ground track does not repeat. Now, what happens in Russia when they launch a satellite like this? Because Russia is at like something like 70 degrees north latitude. And let's put the corresponding part in here. When they launch a satellite from Plisetsk or Star City or wherever, its ground track goes like that. Right, so the ground track is going to cover all the area on the Earth between your latitude and the corresponding south latitude, but not higher. So now, in the case of certain missions, for example, photographic reconnaissance, where we want to take photographs of sorts of other countries or of other areas, if we're launching from the Cape, or we're launching from Vandenberg, which is a little bit higher. I think Vandenberg is I, I, not, not much higher. It's on the west coast. We're only going to be in an orbit that covers from Florida on down to the equator, right? If we want to spy on the Russians, we can't do it with that orbit. So we have to go into a different kind of orbit. And I'll talk about all these specifics later. But just understand that's what a... That's what a uh, a uh, ground track looks like. It's sinusoidal and it only goes between your latitude and the corresponding other latitude. Um, 
So now we ask the question, if it's a circular orbit, how do we define the orbit? How do I communicate in absolute terms what is that orbit that I am talking about? Right? Because we could have satellites in, different, in the same orbital plane, but there are different places. They'll never intersect, and their ground traces will never exactly overlap. Yet they're at the same altitude, and they're in the same orbit plane. Right, essentially, it's a, it's a phase thing. So what we have is we have the altitude. Right, so this applies to circular orbits around the Earth. We need an altitude. We need an inclination. Right, that tells us what, what the angle is of the orbit plane. And then we need to know which orbit plane. Is it this one? Is it this one? Is it that one? Is it that one? Is it that one? Well, we do that based on the ascending node. So what we say is, where is it, at what longitude, relative to some datum, does the thing first cross the equator on a northbound trajectory? Right, that ascending node is like an essence of phase. Right, the altitude and the inclination give us a frequency the ascending node gives us a phase. And that, from those three things, you can, we can speci spe specify one orbit. Uh, I think I've already gone on too long with my raspy voice about some of this stuff. Let me just say a few words about delta V. When you do a transfer from one orbit to another, the only thing that matters is the velocity. So you have to spend energy in order to go from your velocity to the velocity of the orbit you want to go into. Delta V then would be the difference in velocity, right? V2 minus V1. You can translate thrust of a, of a vehicle, you can translate thrust of a vehicle into delta V. So just remember this about delta V. If you, if you were at a, dis, at a conference with rocket scientists and you were talking about a performance of a, of a rocket or a booster or an upper stage or a, a little motor on a satellite, people would say, how much delta V do you have available? So delta V, you can think of delta V as like the amount of the, a resource of how much orbit transfer capability you have. So if you're ever talking to somebody and you want to sound intelligent, and they're talking about rockets, just say, what's the delta V available? Or if you're talking about orbits, what's the delta V required to go from that orbit to the other orbit? It's a resource, right? Delta V is like an asset. It's like cash in the bank. OK, so that, that's essentially all I had to say about um, orbital mechanics. It gets very complicated. Let me make one other comment just before I forget. Everything we've talked about with regard to ground tracks has been around the Earth, and we've used the term apogee and perigee because we're talking about the Earth. What if you're doing some kind of a celestial mission or an interplanetary or you know, extra solar system even exploratory mission? Obviously, we can't use the longitude on the Earth's surface to indicate the ascending node. So they, someone has developed this arbitrary standard. They call it... It's the, it points to Aries, the constellation Aries. And the, um, the ram, I, I don't think I drew that very well. The sign of the ram, ram goes with Aries, is sometimes shown on some of these diagrams to show that absolute direction. And that gives you then, because the Earth Here's the sun, and the Earth is going around the sun. So any kind of an Earth-based standard we were going to use for phase, as the Earth moves around the sun, it's going to change. And so that would be incredibly irritating. Whereas the sign of the ram is always the same. And so that's what's used in celestial orbital mechanics. OK, I'm going to go, go and prepare the next section, which will talk in general about special kinds of orbits and why they might be of interest. And then the next phase after that will be, what does a satellite look like 
in each of those special orbits and what might we want to have it do. Okay, I hope you find this interesting. Send all your questions to solve at midnighttutor.com.